Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's AI Summit. My name is Daniel Shordinis. I'm SVP of Global Marketing at Yellowfin. And I'm also joined by one of our lead consultants in EMEA, Brett Churchill, and we're really excited to talk about the rise in AI technologies and analytics and show you firsthand how this can be applied to a pretty exciting use case being NHS A&E data. Now, for those of you who may be tuning in from outside the UK, um, the NHS is the National Health Service, and in particular, health is one area that we're really starting to see great advancement um, in these technologies that, that are really emerging. So I'm going to start by talking about some of the great examples of AI tech being trialled and in some cases actually applied in NHS Trust today, and then try to break down what this actually means for analytics and this new wave in the BI world, and one that we've been crying out for for some time. I'm going to talk about how we got there and then share with you the state of play at the moment, what's happening with your colleagues. You know, we've teamed up with Computing Magazine and surveyed analytics leaders around the UK to find out, you know, where they are on their analytics journey, you know, how they're looking to provide insight to their users, and what are the priorities as they're looking to really drive their investment in technology. And finally, you know, for the fun stuff, we're going to show you these technologies in action with some of that NHS A&E data that we've been uh, testing with. So there are already some fantastic AI-driven applications across the NHS today. In North London, they've been trialling a chatbot named Babylon to really help answer medical questions. And it's said to be able to process billions of symptom combinations much faster and more accurately than the human brain. And from an NHS perspective, that's the hope to actually reduce the pressure on the triple one non-emergency services. And then you've got Moorfield's Eye Hospital in London who are using an artificial intelligence scanning method that could quickly diagnose and help prevent sight loss with the real potential to cut down the amount of time doctors are spending diagnosing from scans. And lastly, you've got Addenbrooke Hospital in Cambridge who are using an AI system properly titled Inner Eye to automatically scan prostate cancer patients. And really, you know, the neuro-oncologist Dr. Raj Jenner sums up, I guess, what this means for them um, as best. And it's about, you know, they have to define where a tumor is, define the healthy tissue they want to protect, otherwise they can't start treatment. And that is where the bottleneck's occurring. And the quicker you get it done, the quicker you can get a patient treatment. And with AI, this task is essentially completed uh, in minutes. And that's really what these technologies are doing. They're automating um, manual tasks. I'll skip ahead a little bit there. Um, really saving time as we're able to kind of churn through an immense amount of data to produce the insights that's needed. Now, one thing I did forget to mention at the start, um, there are some there's a question panel on your um, Bright Talk screen there. So if you do have any questions as we're going along, please add them in there. And Brett and myself, we've left 10 minutes at the end to go through all your questions. But as we're you know, starting to look at AI in the world of analytics, and you know, we're kind of seeing it everywhere at the moment, and which kind of leads me to my next slide, which I previewed a few moments ago, it's a little bit buzzwordy. Um, you know, people used to ask me, does Yellowfin do big data? And I'd Kind of roll my eyes because big data can mean many things to many people and you're hearing these words like ai and ml kind of and marketers and we're included in this get quite trigger happy with its use but there are some genuine cases on how these technologies can help solve the analytics problems that organizations are facing so what does this actually mean in the analytics world of today to start with it's all about automation and depending on the maturity of products or vendors, this can vary. So those of you who follow the space, um, particularly the few vendors out there, have seen that a lot of them are actually buying this tech, looking to implement in you know, 12 to 18 months time. There are others like us who have been doing this for some time now and are bringing our next generation to market. But what these capabilities actually look like, and it starts with automated analytics. So essentially doing the heavy lifting for you to kind of create reports, create charts um, with a lot of direction. At the next stage, you have what's called augmented intelligence. So essentially you're asking the question off your analytics platform and it's automatically creating the insight for you and often providing 
a natural language explanation to help you actually understand what's going on. And the next stage of that is what's called autonomous intelligence. So without any prompting, you know, essentially doing all the work in the background and then surfacing the most important things as they happen. It might be an outlier, it might be a change in trend, a spike or a trough, but it's doing this automatically and delivering it to the end user without uh, any prompt. But as we get into the, this new age, let's first talk about kind of how we've got here. And you know, for those who have been in this field um, for some time, I'm going to take a little bit down memory lane. And this is a fairly straightforward kind of interpretation um, from Constellation uh, Research. Um, now, those who have been around in BI since its kind of early days, and unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, I'm one of those people, um, started really gaining prominence in the kind of early to mid 90s you had business objects cognos crystal reports that used to be deployed to you know quite large organizations because they were the only ones that could afford them and this was it led the expert was leading the way and for the first time you had dashboards you had scorecards you had this kind of business reporting which is all very exciting but then like anything it had a challenge you know the challenge to actually get the right information to the right person at the right time and make it accessible ultimately for the business when they needed it. And then you got to this next stage in the mid 2000s of this data discovery, which was you know, led by that power user by the analyst. And they could now you know, have, have the power to do data discovery, you know, create their own visualizations and even do the data preparation yourself. But with that, you know, as you gave more people keys to the kingdom, you had a big problem with governance emerge out of this and essentially allowing a lot of people access um, and then losing sight of what was, I guess, the truth uh, amongst all that. And then you have this kind of next wave AI that goes by name. It's about the technology the business user. So it's enabled by machine learning algorithms. It's enabled by you know, automation and natural language interfaces. But again, there are challenges here. You've got you know, a trust challenge. You know, am I going to trust that the machine is giving me the right answer? Do I have transparency to the way that this has been calculated? Because I'm going to be making some pretty critical business decisions. So again, there is um, a lot of challenges with this kind of new kind of state of play uh, that we're at. And kind of lastly, this is just a quote from Gartner, and I'm not going to um, read it all out, but it, and they talk about this wave as augmented analytics. Once again, those who follow Gartner and, and follow analytics know that this is this is where the future is heading. You know, this is from a paper, I think even a year and a half ago, and it's and the way that Gartner and many other analyst firms are pushing it, um, this next wave, this is front and center, and this is something that we should all be kind of looking at now for what it potentially could mean for our organizations. And I know us as vendors have been um, investing in this for quite some time. Um, but what is the actual state of play? Um, in organizations like yours? And, and what are some of the, the challenges that they're facing at the moment? So we teamed up with uh, a third party, um, Computing Research, to essentially kind of ask the questions um, of your peers. And we wanted to you know, share some of those results with you today. Um, firstly, you know, what did the audience look like? And we, oh, that's Computing, spoke to about 110 odd kind of UK analytics leaders, and they were predominantly the head of IT, um, I guess the head of their, their, their analytics team. And they were kind of medium to large size organizations. So the biggest kind of range you can see there being the 1,000 to 5,000 range, all the way to kind of 5,000 plus. So organizations that had their own analytics teams. Now we know that the dashboard is the primary mechanism for delivering insights. So we asked, you know, what was it used for? And, you know, uh, not surprisingly, um, the bulk was for operational and strategic uh, reporting. Um, you know, nothing too kind of startling over here. Um, but once we kind of probed into the information a bit further, this is where it got you know really interesting for us. When talking about you know dashboard usage and support, we found that over seventy percent of the group said that only a small amount of people were actually using the dashboards that they created for them. But of that group, and the majority being that 
so the actual support levels were a fair amount to a great deal. So, you know, not a lot of people adopting the dashboards and still requiring a lot of support. And we asked the question why, they said, well, only 23% said they were actually easy to use. So you've got not a lot of people using them, essentially finding them hard to use, and for those analytics teams, it's costing them a lot of time to support that essentially something that is just not utilized. And unfortunately, it's that humble dashboard that where things you know, are falling short. You know, this has and still continues to be the primary method that business users consume analytics. And you know, we all make investments in dashboards, whether it be to create them, to make them better, faster, and vendors, we do this a lot. But when it comes to business users, and think about this across a large organization with differing degrees of technical skills, when it gets to actually discovering and then getting in there and then understanding it and acting, um, it, it, isn't, it just isn't happening. You know, there's opportunity that's hidden behind this aggregated view of the world. And the reason that they're falling short is because oh, a number of things actually. You know, as soon as data changes, as soon as your structure changes, as soon as something, you know, things have to be built and rebuilt uh, again. They have to be used. And as we can see from you know, some of the survey results, they're actually not being used, let alone, I guess, how they were kind of made for to slice and dice and actually discover information. They also need to be fully understood. And often you've got complexity with information with no narrative or action to help prompt the business user as to what to do next. And we know about this huge influx of data. And you know we know how much is coming in all the time, and there's no way it's going to be able to keep up, you know, with, with, with the influx that's going on at the moment. Essentially, you know, they are great for monitoring, but when it comes to discovery, they are falling short. And asking, you know, these leaders, what is the biggest shortfall? And for them, there was two things. It was um, understanding, you know, what's changed. As you can see there, so trying to churn through the data to find out what's happened, and time time it takes to get the insights they need to run their business. That was number one with a bullet. And those two kind of things, you know, time and insight, that is what automation can help deliver. This is what, you know, according to the survey, analytics leaders are crying out for and what these AI technologies can actually provide, which is, you know, why we're here today, why organizations are looking at this tech, you know, for their business. And as I kind of mentioned earlier, there are vendors that, you know, have this technology, and this is a Gartner slide from an event they did kind of last year, talking about you know what they call the augmented analytics space, and talking about the vendors that are leading this field, and why you know we're here today, why we're sponsoring this event, is because we are recognised as a leader in that space. All that being said, what's actually happening today in the use of these technologies, and it's, the reality is only a very very small potential are actually applying them today. But you know, if the biggest barrier is time and insight, leaders need to look at how this innovation can really help them solve these issues. You know, it should be on everyone's radar, which I guess is why all of you are, are listening here, because this is truly where the technology is going. And you know, applying this today will enable you to lead this arena tomorrow. Now, one such kind of emerging leader in this field um, is Gateshead NHS, and I'm going to talk a little about. Um, their story and their journey, um, starting from um, the beginning and then taking to you to the future state when I pass across to Brett. So the Gateshead uh, Health NHS Trust is based in the northeast of England and they're a medium-sized trust with around 4,500 members of staff. Now, the trust runs multiple hospitals and primary care centres all within Gateshead in Tyne and Weir in the northeast of England. Now their primary function is to deliver acute services in hospital and they have a large emergency care centre front of house and they've also heavily invested in that the last couple of years. They also have a pathology hub for the region um, and a number of localities work closely with them. Now Gateshead have been successful and really grown this hub over the last three years and they offer as well as that you know community services such as adult speech, you know, language disorders and maternity services as well. Now, Gateshead is recognised as a digitally mature trust, part of the digital, uh, kind of global digital exemplar program that further accelerates digital transformation. And they're in the top 15 from maturity index point of view. And for those unfamiliar, this is a UK government sponsored program 
that enables trusts to work closely with other trusts who are more digitally mature so they can learn um, from each other and adopt best practices, essentially the best of the best. Now, our customer and um, our main contact here, David Thompson, this slide looking fellow here, is the information and development manager leading information services, development and data teams within the trust. Now, he was going to join us. Um, unfortunately, um, he's not able to, so you've got me for another 10 minutes. But we're really thrilled to kind of share this story with you. And you know, David's team actually sits outside IT, but is made up of information services, analysts, BI, development, clinical software, um, et cetera. So when he got into this role at the trust um, three years ago, he undertook a complete review. And the trust had around 130 registered systems, and there was you know, immediately saw bottlenecks from an analytical and an operational perspective. You know, they were using Cognos, you know, reporting services, Dynastics, whatever that is, um, Click, and good old Excel. And it was a real mixed bag, and none of the analytics tools were being used to their full potential. You know, ClickView was used exclusively for finance, so it was impossible to actually get other data sources, and licensing was quite strict. And Cognos was simply difficult to use, and any new reports had to be built by developers. And David seemed like so many others were spending, you know, far too much time in Excel. Now, Gateshead wanted to decentralize report creation and find a tool that the wider business can use to create and consume content without a huge amount of training. And they also wanted to alleviate some of the work that went to developers. And you know, there was also this driver to have better visibility into their performance and key metrics. And as part of the NHS, you know, the trust you know, works towards this nationally mandated performance and KPI metrics. And there is a huge amount of focus within the hospital to manage these due to the risk of financial and reputational damage if they're not met. So the team would spend you know, a significant amount of time preparing this information and supporting root cause analysis when needed. So for example, analysts would spend around two days a week on a referred to treatment time report that was aggregating data, visually checking it, applying rules within Excel, distributing it to the wider audience, which would then have to validate and review any poorly performing patients. And the fact that these reports took up to two days a week to process indicates how painfully manual the process was. Then there was validating the data, which meant going back and looking at poorly performing patients. When, you know, when targets were missed um, or patients kind of deemed at risk, staff would have to go through and understand you know, what's happened, where it's happened, who sent the letter. And these outliers would have to be reviewed manually each week and then rolled up. And thankfully, you know, this process and other KPI performance reporting um, has been optimized um, with Yellow Pen. I'll show you a few examples in just a moment's time. Um, I'm not going to read the quote, but they went through a full selection process. You know, they had a great recommendation from our partner, System C. And you know, the main reason for choosing was around that ease of use that didn't need the training. And you know, it was a great functional fit and, and it looked fantastic. So um, as I said, that's a few of the quotes um, from David there. But you know, the business case was originally based on cost savings and you know, rationalizing the use of kind of so many analytics tools. But I'm about to say that we've kind of um, gone beyond our initial scope and um, essentially it's Yellowfin's used more than ever across the trust. So beyond the analytics team, it, it's accessed by you know, hundreds of people, including finance, service line managers, clinicians, execs. And they also use our API functionality to deliver external facing content outside the trust to hundreds of people. Um, now, their new analytics deployment um, actually removed a huge amount of admin work for their team, which was approximately kind of a week a month. And here's an example of a referred to treatment time report, which those from the NHS on the call probably seem familiar, um, which they've been able to apply to um, basically all their business rules in there within Yellowfin. So staff can simply click on a metric and see everything they need to for a particular patient, you know, what happened, when it happened, if appointment was missed, everything um, from an end user's point of view. So it saves a lot of time and resource and just makes it easy to see the big picture. Another use case was for service line and waiting list managers to track patients on you know, various patient waiting list uh, bandings. And we allow them to you know, review the current position, pinpoint those risks through a high risk report. Gateshead has also built kind of threshold-based alerts that go out to specific teams and individuals. And these are kind of early learning reports that give them insight to what's happening so they can optimize the care that they provide. 
Now, another great example of improving care is the kind of estimated date of discharge report, uh, which you can see here in yellow pin. So the access on um, left hand side, that's 100%, 90%, et cetera. And the EDD report is used um, you know, for all consultants to show how effective they're recording in EDD based on per ward. Um, so it's basically personalised planning for each patient it really helps prevent you know, delays in discharge and it aims to estimate when a patient will be discharged, thereby you know, releasing their bed for another patient. Now with this report, you know, Gateset can now do ward by ward comparison to see who has completed this information, when and also how accurate their assessment was. And this is really helping to drive efficiency but also to monitor nurses and consultants' diagnosis and review kind of, and compare wards for accuracy. In addition to avoiding delays, this report really helps Gateshead run essentially its hospital better and meet its patients' needs. And they're looking for 100% accuracy here. And the last kind of example I'm going to show you is the kind of bed state analysis dashboard that gives an overall picture of what's happening um, in the key areas of the hospital and really gives a side-by-side -side view of patient flow uh, in A&E and the emergency assessment unit and their inpatient wards, while also showing what beds are free now and in the future. So a patient's estimated date of discharge um, is, is a key driver of this because the accuracy of this is crucial in order to aid you know, kind of decision making. So at the bottom here, you can see that kind of light A&E performance metric, and this acts as an early indicator to um, a deteriorating position. So hopefully this has painted a, a good picture of, I guess, their journey uh, to date and you know, how Yellowfin is currently being used to support you know, different types of analysis, you know, processes, management and optimization. So now let's um, get into the good stuff uh, and, and the future. So kind of late last year, um, we launched a suite of products that's combining kind of industry-based automated analysis, storytelling and collaboration. And we're currently engaging with Gateshead with one of these products Yellow signals, which is our big foray into this kind of AI-driven world, a way to automatically discover the most important changes and trends as they happen. We're combining this with another product called Yellow Stories to enable you to kind of share the, the context and the narrative with multiple people. So, you know, this summit is about kind of AI in, in the real life, but I think it's kind of fair to say the application of this technology is still with those kind of early adopters and evident in the computing research, you know, only 3.9% of UK orgs have actually implemented this when only a quarter of them are currently evaluating. But, you know, that is how it starts. You know, we're starting to see that shift where early adopters are seeing the benefits. So now's the time to really explore what this technology um, can do for your organization. And with that, I'm gonna get into the real life stuff, the real life Kind of accident and emergency data. Now, part of how we currently work in Gateshead is utilizing signals across a &E data to see if we can help them optimize their service. So with that, I'm going to pass across to Brett, who's going to tell you a little bit about signals and then really show you this in action. Over to you. Thank you, Dan. Um, so as, as Dan mentioned, we're going to now shift our folks a little bit more onto more of the signals component of the Yellowfin and have a look in particular at a, an A and E example that we've, uh, we've looked at with Gateshead. But just as a quick introduction, um, my name is Brett Churchill, as you see there. I'm a, the Senior Product Consultant at Yellowfin. And I'll be taking you through this example on this, this uh, case study today. So one thing we might do before we look at the particular case study is just cover a little bit more information on, on signals within Yellowfin and, and what they actually do. So as, as a good overview of signals, Signals are really focused on the ability to, to slice your data into uh, time series parts. So really what you're looking at there is the ability to slice up your data by those different dimensions and be able to automatically start analyzing those different key metrics by those slices. So it could be the case of you have a, a site uh, and you might be slicing by each site and looking at the key metrics for each of those sites, looking for outliers, trends, uh, those kind of uh, those kind of insights, but it's really focused here on statistically significant deviations. So really making sure that you're alerted to the most important metrics, the most important spikes, the most important anomalies. And in this case, it's 
And it's not really um, looking at the threshold based alert side of things like you might do with something like uh, a broadcast where you have a very particular scenario you're looking for. In this case, Yellowfin Signals are really looking to answer the questions that you might not have thought to ask or those particular scenarios you might not have looked at before and really surface those for the users. And to do that, Yellowfin has six different types of patterns that it will detect within the signals. So firstly, it's the nice simple spikes and troughs. So uh, where is your data uh, moving too high or too low? Is it moving outside a confidence interval? Is it an anomaly compared to the rest of the data and a particular trend? Uh, you might have changes in trends themselves. So uh, for last year or this year or this month, our data was, was quite flat, but now we see this month or this year, we're seeing a 15% increase from the start to the end of the period, and that could be something worth investigating. Uh, it will also look at step changes, so uh, changes in your metrics uh, that have persevered, so your data has been had values of 10, 11, 10, 12, suddenly it's looking at 51, 54, 52. You've had a step up and down and you might want to investigate that and have that surfaced as a signal. Uh, we'll also look at things like new and lost attributes, so where you might have had data before that there are no longer is data, or you have a new value for a metric that's emerged, really highlighting those changes there through the new and lost attributes. And then lastly, what we have is the changes in volatility and the aggregation, so looking at uh, the case where your data might have become more volatile, your metric is, is more up and down than it usually is, and you might want to investigate why those changes are occurring. So there's, there are six key patterns that Yellowfin is going to actively look for within your signals and try to highlight those and surface those as alerts for you. In terms of the signals themselves, if you're looking underneath, uh, we do use industry best practice algorithms for detecting all these different types of signals. Uh, we also have built-in functionality so that Yellowfin is going to learn from this user interaction. Uh, and what it's going to do then is be able to then personalize those signals, maybe for the next time that they're run. And I'll go through that in a little bit more detail in my demonstration. Uh, also, uh, Yellowfin is making use of that metadata layer that you find within Yellowfin. That's the foundation for everything we do in Yellowfin. And in the signals case, that's where you're setting up your signals, uh, setting up that automation, and being able to define what you're, what you're looking for loosely, what type of analysis you might want to do. And again, making use of all that great metadata, uh, formatting, definitions, all, all that information that you've put into your metadata layer. And if we're looking at uh, signals, uh, Dan mentioned it's a little bit of a different methodology to, to what, what we may see with uh, more traditional dashboards. And we, we've dropped in this slide here to illustrate that a little bit, looking at a bit of a, a then versus now scenario where uh, previously you may have had a situation where you're looking at a number of steps to be finding your insights, so you're preparing your data, you're creating a report or a chart, you're building a dashboard, you have users then accessing, you've got those users slicing and dicing, uh, and maybe then they're finding a pattern and they're alerting users, they're creating that signal. Whereas what you might be looking at now with, with the signals functionality is you've greatly reduced that particular step. So you've gone from creating uh, that metadata layer straight to having that actionable insight, to having those signals created uh, and being able to alert those users very quickly. And probably the key thing here is having that shorter process means uh, there's less, let the, the process is less subject to human bias or analysis fatigue. Uh, it can be constantly replicated there. And if you find that using that longer process, basically the more you do it, the less likely you might have uh, a chance of actually finding that signal. So keeping that process very short and making that alert very quick and simple and finding a lot more value uh, within that particular method of, of, of finding those key statistics, anomalies uh, and metrics as well. 
And another thing just to demonstrate how we might uh, recognize a signal within Yellowfin, and this could be looking at more of a, uh, an outlier analysis or a period on period analysis. What we might have is our data set up uh, by week. And what we're seeing is as we're moving along uh, each week, we're seeing uh, the same patterns emerge, the same averages, the same uh, kind of trends. But then what we might be seeing is trends that are sitting outside uh, those particular confidence intervals or those, those regular areas of data. And we might be then creating and highlighting those signals. And you can see here as we go along, uh, it's still working through that data every week. It's an automated process and it's really alerting you when those particular changes are occurring, making sure that you've got that information when and where it is actually happening. So underneath, we do have some, some key areas with our signals and we, we really put that down to what we call a, a secret source. So the three key areas there are the fact that it's automated, so it's continuously running against your data, uh, maybe as a batch process every week, every month, every day, and it's looking for those significant changes. And then once you have those signals, it's then personalized. So based on what you're doing, how you're interacting, what the behaviors are, uh, it's, it's refining that process to show you the more important and interesting signals for you. And also what it's doing there is, is it's correlated. So it's finding patterns across different data sets, looking for those relationships and trying to highlight those as well, giving you that additional level of insight. So what we might do is we're going to jump across more to our A and E case study. And, and what we might look at here, this is uh, one of the great dashboards uh, that we see built by Gateshead. Uh, and you can see here, this is, this is exactly built for purpose. It's, it's great, giving some great insight when you're looking at things like operational uh, or strategic reporting. There's a lot of uh, insight, trends, ideas, uh, data values that are, that are found from that. But then what we have is that additional methodology or that different way that we can then go and find and detect those trends and really shorten that period. So not to replace, but really to complement. And that's what we're going to do uh, with our signals today. So what I'm going to do is now quickly uh, share my screen. So we've got our, our yellow fin open here. And just to preface my demonstration, uh, I might just explain this data set a little bit that we're working with. So here we're looking at A and E uh, data, so the admissions to particular sites. Uh, this data is made up of all the admissions. It's also made up a little bit of staffing. Uh, the data set itself, uh, we've mocked up, but we've mocked that up based on the trends, the patterns, the values that we've seen in Gateshead and other NHS clients, just to make it a lot more realistic for you as well. And the key focuses for this data set, we're looking at things like the wait times, uh, basically how long a patient is waiting to be admitted or processed. Uh, and this is, this is a key statistic, the number of patients, the wait times, uh, we do have the, the situation where you may have breaches, where a wait time has exceeded uh, a certain time period, so maybe 240 minutes. And those breaches are now going to be the focus uh, of the signals. And what we do have in the NHS and, and in the, the healthcare sector is, is a lot of reporting and focus on these breaches. So maybe you have the case where you have uh, more than 5% breaches or, or more than 95% non-breaches. And this might then prompt some uh, a response within the organization, within the healthcare uh, trust. So you might, that might then prompt an investigation. It might prompt a report to management to explain what might be happening. And that could be something that is even then shared with regulators and discussed. Uh, and we're looking at ways of mitigation for that. So that would be the basis of the data set that we're looking at today. So what I'm going to do is log in to my Yellowfin instance. And what we're going to do straight away is browse into uh, my timeline. So you can see here we've actively, we've set up our signals. We're looking at some of those key topics. Uh, firstly, I can see that I've got a lot of signals that have been created for me. And that could be pushed out to different email addresses or shown to the users as part of uh, their timeline. What you could also do is head across to 
uh, the signal section itself. And what we can do is start looking at those signals uh, in more detail. And these signals have been built up looking at a number of different uh, analysis types. Um, and what we can do is just have a look at a few of those and see how they might relate. So what we might have is some signals being uh, created and surfaced here. Uh, we can see things like we have a change in trend. Uh, we can see that when patients are being treated by general practitioners, we're actually seeing that uh, the wait time is increasing slower. So that's a positive. That's something that we can investigate to see what we've been doing to find this positive trend. What we could also see is how uh, wait times or number of patients might become more volatile. We can see where general items have decreased, uh, either with positive or negative results. Things like the numbers of patient counts in particular sites. Um, even we can see here some of the key statistics that are coming through around the levels of breaches, if we have spikes or drops or step ups or step downs. So there's a range of insights being surfaced here for the end user. And what they do is they have the ability to, to interact with those firstly as a whole. So you could be reviewing your signals, you could be filtering down by different types of signals from different data sets, uh, different uh, types again that I mentioned, or even searching through for key values for sites or triage categories that might have been useful. So you can start looking and reviewing those signals what you also have the ability to do is to see who has been responding to those signals, who's owning those signals. Uh, you could start collaborating on that and we'll expand on that in a little bit as well. But what we might do here is just focus in on one of the particular signals, just to explain a little bit more of how you might interact with one of these signals that's come through from your A&D admissions data. So our particular focus here is the wait time and the potential number of breaches. Uh, so what we might have here is a signal that's been prompted, that's popped up and said, okay, we have had a spike with the number of breaches. Uh, and what we can start doing is reviewing that and addressing what might be happening. And to do that, we can start reviewing uh, the signal and some of the signal properties. So we can see that the blue line here is our uh, metric over time, so the number of patients, the number of breaches that we might have had. Uh, this is using outlier analysis, so we're creating automatically uh, this nice moving average that then in itself is creating this confidence interval. And we can see here on the signal that Yellowfin has created, uh, it's picked this up, it's, it's noticed that the actual value has gone 4% outside that confidence interval. And that's something we really need to respond to. So that's, that's a signal that I want to keep track of. Uh, and I can review that further. I could go and adjust my time period to see what previous periods of data might look like. Or what I can even do here is start using this signal and, and addressing the situation and what might have prompted this particular signal. Uh, and we can do this in a few different ways. We could interact with it. So again, you have your hover to see the extra information. Uh, you might have other signals uh, that are popping up as well that you might see at the bottom that you could link through to. Uh, you will also have this ability on the right here to start exploring the signal in more detail. So in this instance, you might not want to see the moving average. You could hide and show different elements. You could also see that you have some related and correlated metrics here. Uh, so maybe what we want to do against the patient numbers is start maybe relating the actual wait time against that. So to see if there's a particular correlation between the patient numbers and the wait time. Or one thing we did mention before is that correlated data set. Uh, so maybe what we're going to do here uh, is then be able to, okay, I'll just remove that one is be able to look at other data sets. So maybe this, these are metrics that have come across from other views. Yellowfin has recognized there might be a correlation here. So we could click this and start overlaying other metrics, maybe from your staffing, maybe from your uh, admissions, maybe from your finance department, that could be useful and that could uh, give you some more key insight into why this particular situation is happening. So you can start reviewing these signals you can start interacting with them. 
Uh, one thing we mentioned before is that uh, the interactions and the behavior is going to then shape what you see in the next iteration of your signals. So if you are uh, doing things like making this useful, if you're making this your favorite, if you're watching the signal, uh, if you have gone and uh, clicked on it a number of times, all these different interactions and behaviors are going to feed back into Yellowfin and really look at, at that learning component of, of the signals. Make use of that information and provide a more targeted and more useful signal the next time for the users. What you will also see down here uh, towards the bottom is you'll have more ways to start expanding on this signal to, to look at the collaborative side of things. So what we might be doing is starting a discussion uh, with other users with key comments or ideas or questions. What we might also be doing is looking at the relevance of the signal. And this applies really nicely to uh, NHS A and E data because you're actually getting the relevance here of breaches versus non-breaches. And we can see that our breaches here are sitting at right on 5%. Uh, so maybe we want to see if we can reduce that down or that might be a threshold that we need to start reporting on or alerting users to. Uh, another, th another component you will see down the bottom of your signal uh, is your analysis. And this is uh, using that assisted uh, insights that you have in Yellowfin as part of your reports or your dashboards. So basically what, what Yellowfin has done is for this signal it's gone and auto-generated a range of other visualizations. It's, it's ge generated these insights. So each one of those is a key visualization and some natural language generated narrative. And what you can see here is these are looking at some different dimensions, some different metrics, uh, some different slices and dices of those. And what that might do is, is add some more context or more useful information to back up the findings that you've currently uh, got coming through in your signal. So you could see that, okay, we've got the triage category, we've got the actual staff type treating the patient, and we can see we have a hot spot here. And that could be leading to an increase in uh, that, that wait time or those breaches that you're seeing. So this extra information being auto-generated and brought in and attached to that signal that you're looking at. Or even the, uh, the key part of signals here is the integration with stories. So giving you the ability to take this signal, this, this finding that's been surfaced for you, and then be able to share that with other users in a very nice, simple format uh, that's still very powerful. So what we might have done here is gone and created a story, so if we look at underneath of our signal, we've got a story that we've created. And this could be combining uh, the signal data that you have, uh, some useful text that could be combining um, images, embedded videos, live reports, uh, and really using that to, to paint a picture of what's happening, what you've found, and add in all that context uh, that you have. So what we can do is have a look at this signal in a little bit more detail just to uh, elaborate on the particular case that we've looked at here. So with this particular signal, we've seen that the number of AIA A and E attendances have spiked significantly, and that's on the 31st of December, and that's causing a breach now. We can see our signal that's been included. So what we might want to do is firstly determine where are these breaches coming from. Maybe we need to, we've built this quick report here based on our sites and our triage categories. Uh, and we can see that, okay, all these, most of these breaches are at um, our Queen Elizabeth or our Riverside or our Bladen. So quickly adding some extra information to qualify where we might be seeing this. And that could be the first step to explaining what might be going on. But then what we could also do is start bringing in external information, so maybe uh, data or, or insights that, that are found outside of Yellowfin or outside the data set. So maybe uh, one, of our, one of our administrators noticed that we had some quite unruly weather in that particular period. So we've added in a few uh, nice screenshots of what we were seeing at that particular time. We were seeing a storm flow through, we were seeing quite low temperatures, so we thought we should investigate that a little bit more. And what we found is when we went and created a report using some of our weather data, so we can see now on the 31st of December, we've got quite a high uh, average 
uh, wind speed or maximum wind speed, and we've got an incredibly low temperature. So what we're starting to do is bring all those elements together, and we can start to suggest that maybe this is having an effect. That extreme of weather is starting to push up the number of uh, uh, attendees or admissions that we're having uh, at these particular locations. So we're bringing all that information together, and this could be the underlying cause of the breach that has occurred. Although what we might want to do is also have a look at another data set to see if we can correlate that, because if we have uh, more extreme weather, we have more patients through the door, more breaches, maybe we need to review how we are staffing that. If, are we staffing appropriately for the increased numbers? So what we've done again is, is gone and built a, a quick report with our staffing data. We've brought that into our signal and to our story. We can see that we had slightly lower levels of staffing for this particular period. Uh, that's the one highlighted in the blue. So maybe, again, that's a nice correlation. So if we're seeing more extreme weather, it's going to push up the number of patients. We need to be then more vigilant on how are we uh, staffing and, and setting our staffing levels. And again, this can lead to some, uh, some developments in, in new processes or, or new, new trends that you're setting up within the organization. So maybe if we start looking at overlaying the weather forecast data for the next 24 to 48 hours, we can start looking for those extremes, and then we might be starting to uh, adjust our staffing based on those weather, those weather patterns, and more accurately addressing the number of patients that are coming through. So again, allowing the users to take all this information uh, and be able to forward plan this a lot more effectively. So this is a story we've created to try and elaborate on what might be happening there. And as we mentioned before, when I discussed this data set, uh, if we have, when we have processes uh, within the NHS uh, to notify of breaches, to report those back, to share those with regulators, uh, this could be a great way to be able to do that. You've got your story that you've created, you've got your live data that's been included, and if we go to our story in particular, we could easily start sharing that maybe with our management team or our regulators. So I might just go and quickly say, I want to send this to the central management team as the first process uh, that we usually follow. And now we have that information out to the right people, and we can start reviewing that with the management team. We can share any potential insights with regulators and work on ways to mitigate that in the future. And all this has come, come from making use of those signals, um, highlighting those insights, and then being able to quickly turn those into more contextual explanations of what might be happening. And that's what we're seeing now with our signals and how you could make use of those in uh, the A and E admissions uh, example that we've currently gone through. So that, that, that covers our, our demonstration side of things. So what I might do is I might hand back uh, to Dan just with a, a last uh, cover off slide for you. Excellent. Thank you uh, for that, Brett. Really appreciate you going through that. Now, for those you might have noticed, we have a number of different attachments there. So um, based on what you saw here, whether it's about you know, these technologies, in particular about signals, you know, some great examples of NHS customers, um, and some information on the products, that's all available from the attachments and links in your um, Bright Talk box over there. So really, I mean, that concludes the, um, our session for today. And thank you all for attending. So if you did have any questions, and I already see there's some there, please um, pop them in now. And Brett and myself will go through them all. So first one's over here. Will the slides be uh, available uh, after this session? Uh, yes, they will. So um, we'll be able to make those available to all the attendees. Um, after this session uh, as well. Next question, uh, what does Yellowfin provide that Tableau and Click doesn't? Geez, I could go on and on and on here, and I am very, very biased. Um, but look, what we showed you here today, which is the signals and the stories product, um, Tableau, Click, uh, there aren't many others doing things near that. So those two pieces there, and, and they are actually separate products from us, um, 
are very, very different um, and they provide something that, that these vendors, vendors don't. Interesting thing about stories, as you saw there, and that's really our kind of, our kind of long form analysis tool. Um, you can actually embed Tableau and quick reports in there because we know that large organizations still need to tell their data story and you can actually um, put in other tools like that. So um, there is a long list, but I'm happy to go into detail. Um, probably would take far longer than the, this Bright Talk session uh, will allow. Uh, can your charts update on live streaming data without browser refreshes? Brett, do you want to take that technical one? Uh, so that would depend if we are focusing in on the, the signals uh, in particular or we are looking at uh, the reports from the reporting and the dashboarding side of things. Um, Yellowfin does have the ability to obviously give you access to view those reports and dashboards in a live manner. So every time you run them or you change your filters, you're seeing the live data come through. But you can also then uh, prompt reports and dashboards to automatically refresh themselves against the schedule. Uh, what you have with the signals as well uh, is, is, the, is the option again between having completely live data coming through in your signal versus having cache signals so you're seeing exactly what you saw at that point in time in when, you're, when your signal was run. So you do have, do have both options there, although um, signals you're more looking at the signals generated at those points in time rather than trying to run a signal on constantly moving data. So hopefully that, that covers just some of the, uh, the question that you had there around that, that side of things. Cool. All right, another question there. Um, is there anyone else that currently offers something like signals? Um, look, the short answer is, is is not quite. I mean, there. If you look at some of the landscape, um, vendors like Click and Tab and Power BI, they offer some kind of automated analysis on more on the profiling side of things. And if you look at some of the others, like say your thought spot, the Watson, the Einsteins. Um, now, Brett kind of alluded to a little bit of what we do with what we call assisted insights, where you ask a question of the data and it essentially creates your analysis for you and gives you a natural language explanation. So we do it via a point and click interface, others do it via written. Um, the, and there's, I guess, other smaller vendors that are doing something similar to signals, but none of them are actually combining all those um, as you kind of saw together there. Okay, how do I know if people are reading my stories? Brett, do you want to take that one? Fantastic. Well, that, that one is actually one little thing I, I didn't mention, but you, you may have seen that uh, when, I was, when I was viewing my story, what you will have across the top of your story is a nice summary panel. So this is your story name, this is who has created it, these are the co-authors. What you will also have across the top there is a little clap button. So firstly, you can see users who have endorsed that story, so they've, they've given it a clap, they've endorsed it. What you will also have next to that is a list of users telling you who has actually read your story. So it's a really good way to see what kind of uptake you're getting on the information you're providing. Do you have one or two or a hundred people that have viewed that story? So you can really gauge the effectiveness of the information and the insight you're finding. Cool. Thanks, Brett. Okay, what new skills will users need to develop and make the best use of this technology? That's um, a really good question. Um, look, from the, the broader sense in terms of skills, and, and I mean, one part of this that we found in talking to our customers and starting to look at this is the analysts actually becoming data storytellers essentially. So while it's not a, a skill from a technology perspective, it is, a, it is a change in skill that it isn't about building and creating, but it's, you know, being able to utilize these tools and leverage it to do a lot of the hard work for you essentially. Then how do you then convey that analysis or use essentially a signal to then you know, determine, uh, I guess, your analysis in your point of view. So that's certainly one of the skill shifts. Um, in terms of some of the technical skill shifts, um, look, one of the key things with signals is, um, as well as you know, configuring it, turning it on, it's actually understanding, uh, I guess, how your data is structured, um, the um, velocity of that data. So, for example, if your business runs on a Monday to Friday during certain hours, when things dip on Saturday, that's not really a change you care about. So, it's about you know configuring, um, you know. 
the signals in this case or the technology to suit the way that your data is structured and your business is run. So it's trying to fit that as well. And that's what we certainly found um, implementing this for the first time uh, with our customers. Um, can you can be hosted on, hosted on services like AWS and on-prem? Certainly can, um, certainly on-premise. We've got AWS, Azure, Google Cloud. We've actually got um, free 12-month uh, user licenses to trial on AWS and Azure as well. So if you go to their marketplaces, uh, you'll find that there. We're just about to load the next um, iteration of Yellowfin 8. Um, so it'll be available uh, next week for everyone to have a play with. So Brett, the technical one for you. Can you use uh, CAF? to feed Yellowfin signals? Uh, well, basically with the Yellowfin signals, they, they operate in the same way as any other source that you might be reporting on from a report or a dashboard perspective. So therefore, if you have the ability to connect through to the particular source from Yellowfin, uh, if there's something like a JDBC connector, uh, an API hook into that you can hook into, uh, as long as you can connect to that source from Yellowfin, then you could actually run those signals on top of that. Cool. That's, a, that's actually a good question. I'm not going to find out from our guys about that one because I'd be interested to know if it does feed uh, Catherine. Um, cool. Did I hear right that the system learns from interactions with users? Does this mean that a poor user can make the system, uh, skew the system so that it focuses on the wrong things? Um, poorly worded, but you know what I'm getting at. Yeah, uh, that's that's a very um, good question and one that our uh, internal product teams have also been trying to think about and deal with because you're exactly right. If someone is incorrectly going, well, this is not important when actually it is. And so yes, to your question, the system will actually learn what's important from the signals that you um, find based on the dimensions, um, the measure, the time, and it will kind of learn from that and therefore decide whether or not it's, it's relevant anymore for you. Um, but yeah, that is a consideration that we are actually working through um, and looking at that. Um, so it is a great question, but it's one that we're kind of grappling with in terms of yeah, getting that usability and interaction to get it right versus when someone does, does get it wrong, but really great question. Um, when building the dashboard, does Yellowfin offer an end-to-end -end solution including user authentication or do I build HTML frames and ingest the views from Yellowfin? Good question. Uh, Brett, over to you with that one. Uh, well, Yellowfin uh, does, does offer that, that solution. So uh, earlier Dan mentioned the, the suite of products that Yellowfin has there. Um, so that includes the ability to obviously set up the, uh, your Yellowfin uh, environment, be able to connect through to the data to be able to read that data through, develop your metadata, your reports, your dashboards, uh, your signal. Um, so if, if you're looking from that perspective, Yellowfin does give you that ability to offer that end-to-end -end solution and that includes authentication. So Yellowfin does include uh, some, some Yellowfin uh, standard authentication. You could also uh, uh, integrate it with something like LDAP or Active Directory sources. Uh, a lot of our a lot of our partners and clients will actually use their own uh, sync, uh, use their own authentication methods such as SAML or OAuth as part of a single sign-on process within Yellowfin as well. Um, so you could have uh, that authentication or even the custom authentication built into that Yellowfin end-to-end -end platform. Cool. Uh, can't you introduce your own algorithms into Yellowfin? Uh, not for the Signals um, product as yet. It, it has been requested um, in terms of that, but that's something our, our product guys are looking at. Um, if you are looking at running different data science algorithms, we do actually, um, we didn't go through this today, but we've got a data preparation and ingestion product that allows you to pump in kind of HOII, R, et cetera, at the, um, report level if you want to run it in real time or if you're then actually kind of um, running it through the data preparation and transformation layer. So you can do run your own algorithms um, through that part of um, the product. Uh, another question here, what's the difference between signals and threshold based alerts? Really good question. So the difference with I guess the more traditional threshold alerts, you're setting it up on things that you know, on things you understand, it, typically at a higher aggregate level. So what Signals is doing, it's running automatically all the time. So Brett showed you that kind of example where you said it week by week, it'll run and run and run. And when it finds something statistically significant, so derived based on the setup, it will alert you automatically. 
and has the ability to get into you know the nitty gritty detail and really lurch into something you know beyond multiple layers of dimensionality to say look this is what's changed over here not you know not necessarily a high level threshold that you've got at one report level at one time so it's automatically it's that autonomous um, kind of uh, that I talked about earlier it's running all the time and then pushing what's important based on the algorithms that have been set up uh, behind the scenes all right so I think that concludes all the questions that we have kind of right on the hour so if there's any more please add them in um, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you getting on uh, the webinar. If you do have any feedback, good or bad, um, we, we're happy to take it either way. So please reach out to myself or Brett or any of the Yellow Fin team, either what you've seen today. Um, if you want to find out more, as I said, there's there are attachments in there or jump on our website at yellowfinbi.com and you, know, you can try signals for yourself or some of the products and see if it might be a good fit um, for your organization. So thanks again for your time and have a good rest of the day wherever you are.